what I want to talk about actually is what I think is one of the most counterintuitive aspects of human behavior, and that is uh, the tendency for people to give confessions to crimes they did not commit. I have uh, been investigating this topic for, for many years now, and I find that people actually intuitively have a better grasp on why somebody might kill themselves and commit suicide than understand why somebody might confess to a crime they did not commit. You would think, in terms of how common it is, that it almost never happens. Uh, when I first got involved in false confession, in the study of false confessions, it was my sense that I was studying a fascinating aspect of social influence, but not an aspect of social influence that was common. The more I see and the more data that have come out, the more we come to realize that people often confess to crimes they did not commit. We know, for example, that if you look at the Innocence Project DNA exoneration cases, if you just take that sample alone, that number now is up over 250. In roughly 25% of those cases, false confessions were a contributing factor. And I say that's surprising because legal scholars for years have assumed that confession is the gold standard of evidence. And that when you had a confession, you had some degree of certainty of conviction. Certainly some people are more vulnerable to giving false confessions than others. Uh, and I say that for a couple of different reasons. Uh, first, it's important to recognize, I think, that very often false confessions occur voluntarily. That is, somebody who has not committed the crime steps forward without police pressure, without police influence, and confesses to something they didn't do. There's a long history of cases just like that. I, uh, years ago, called these voluntary false confessions. But then when it comes down to looking at vulnerability in the police interrogation setting, it is absolutely clear from the wrongful conviction data, from laboratory experiments, from self-report studies, that juveniles are particularly vulnerable. They are disproportionately represented in the population of false confessors. That people with intellectual impairments, the mentally retarded, for example, are disproportionately represented in the population of false confessors. And people with various types of mental illness appear again in, that, in those numbers with, with, with large frequency. It is clear that whether because these populations are naive, whether they are suggestible, whether they are overly compliant, whatever that issue may be, it is clear that in the police interrogation setting where influence is the issue, they are more subject to influence and manipulation than the average person. It is common for people, and, and it would be wrong for people to assume that only the weak and vulnerable confess to crimes they didn't commit. It happens to people who are ordinary, smart, having uh, all, uh, mental health and, 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 and adults. Uh, the reason it happens is, is now it gets down to a story about police interrogation tactics. In the United States, police are allowed to lie about evidence. Police are allowed to turn to a suspect who has for hours denied any involvement and to say to that suspect, you've denied your involvement and yet we have your fingerprints on the murder weapon. Or we have, the victim was in a struggle, we have hair in her grasp, we've done the test, the hair is yours. Or you've taken a polygraph test, a lie detector test, and you failed it. Or you've been identified by a witness. Or we have your fingerprints, or your blood, or your DNA, or what have you. In these cases, we see a number of these cases where the suspect starts to get confused and disoriented and starts to question his or her own innocence. And often the conversation then turns to questions about memory and consciousness. And there are cases on record where suspects who we now know are innocent not only confessed and signed a confession, but they concluded and inferred that they must actually have committed this crime. There is a, a misassumption, a misconception in the criminal justice system that I'd know a false confession if I saw one. Po I've heard police say this, that if they took a false confession, they'd know it. I've heard prosecutors say it, I've heard judges say it. There is this common belief that if somebody were to give a false confession, somehow it would be discernible. It would look different, it would sound different than a true confession. Not so. Uh, my colleagues and I several years ago went into a prison outside of Boston to do the following study. We titled the study, I'd know a false confession if I saw one. We had prisoners confess to the crimes they committed uh, for which they were being incarcerated and we taped their confessions. 
And then we had them on the spot make up a confession to something we knew they didn't do. We showed those tapes to people. We showed them to police detectives, experienced police detectives. We showed them to lay people. People couldn't really tell the difference between the true confessions and the false. And so it's not a wonder that judges and juries uncritically accept confessions whenever they hear them. It's virtually impossible to discern a false confession just by looking at it or just by listening to it. And that's why there are so many cases on record where there is on the one hand for a judge and jury to see a confession. There is on the other hand DNA that excludes the defendant who had confessed. Invariably, confession trumps DNA. It's that powerful. Lots of research has been done. There's lots more to do. Uh, at this point, my colleagues and I are interested in, in two sets of questions. One, I'm interested in using laboratory research methods and the laboratory paradigms that we've developed to try to create more diagnostic interrogation methods. I think interrogation is a process of influence that we could probably design in a laboratory. And we can design it by creating guilt and innocence in a laboratory, by interrogating people, and by looking to see which techniques that we have developed increase the confession rates among the guilty but not among the innocent, which of course is everybody's surgical goal. And so one, one set of studies that we are in the process of conducting is to do just that, to try and use laboratory methods to develop better, more effective interrogation techniques. The second set of uh, uh, research questions that we've been asking has to do with the fact that once a confession is released into the air, everything changes. The judge and the jury see the other evidence around that confession differently. Interpretations change. All sorts of cognitive and behavioral confirmation biases kick in so that once there's a confession, it almost doesn't matter that there's a lot of contradictory exculpatory evidence. There is the confession. In addition, and this I think is the most pernicious and most overlooked, and people don't realize this, and, and I only came to realize this three or four years ago through work I've done in actual cases. The confession has the power to corrupt other evidence. It has the power to change identifications made by eyewitnesses. It has the power to change the reports given by forensic experts. It has the power to eliminate alibis who conclude after hearing that the person they alibied had confessed, they conclude, maybe I was wrong about the time or the place. And so once there is a confession, that confession corrupts other evidence. And why that's so significant is when you go back and look at these false confession cases, guess what? You often find that the confession was not the only error in that case. There was a snitch, there was a forensic expert who made the wrong judgments about, about the testing that was conducted. Uh, alibis have dropped out thinking they were mistaken. Eyewitnesses have changed their identification, this time identifying the confessor. Uh, and so we've actually started to do those kinds of studies. And, and that's significant. It's significant because when an appeals court goes back to review a confession case, what they see often is a, an apparent mountain of evidence. But it's a mountain of evidence that all stems from the confession itself. Essentially, it's not, it's not a mountain of evidence, it's a house of cards.